So our next speaker is Matt Smith from the Mass General. Matt has had a long-term interest in the uh, role of bone uh, agents in protecting against uh, bone events. And interestingly enough, now they have an anti-tumor effect, which we'll hear about. Matt. You may have to wait on the anti-tumor effect results for a few weeks, but I'll do my best to tell you what I can. My thanks to Bruce and STO for this opportunity to discuss bone-targeted therapies for prostate cancer. This has been an area of tremendous progress and promise over the past decade. My presentation will really focus on three areas, osteoclast-targeted therapy, radiopharmaceuticals, and then I'll very briefly comment on the role of targeted therapy and its impact on bone with the exciting new information about cabozantinib. Bone metastases are a major cause of morbidity and a disproportionate cause of mortality in men with advanced prostate cancer. The risks of bone complications span a spectrum of conditions from osteoporosis and fractures related to age and therapy to the most feared complication of prostate cancer, castration-resistant bone metastases. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to focus my comments on uh, treatment and prevention of bone metastases. We'll save the issue of osteoporosis for another time. First, a brief few words about the biology. Normal bone remodeling is a coupled and regulated process that involves a coordinated activity of osteoclasts, which resorb bone, and osteoblasts, which result in new bone formation. And homeostasis between osteoclasts and osteoblasts is necessary to maintain the integrity and strength of bone. In the case of bone metastases, this uh, process is co-opted by tumor. There are complex reciprocal interactions between tumor cells and bone. Prostate cancer cells have potent effects on osteoclasts and osteoblasts, which result in marked increases in bone remodeling. This is a pathologic process, which, which has the net effect of new bone formation, but this bone is disorganized and biomechanically weak. In turn, uh, oste the bone microenvironment, the many growth factors elaborated by osteoclasts and osteoblasts, have potent effects on tumor cells, and this is very much in line with the earlier comments you heard from Dr. Stathew about the microenvironment. In this case, we're talking about the bone microenvironment. The clinical complications of bone metastases are well known to this audience. Bone metastases from prostate cancer are associated with pain, fractures, spinal cord compression, and the common need for other interventions, including surgery and radiation to bone. And this is an exa a dramatic example of a patient with extensive osteoblastic metastases by uh, technetium bone scan. About 10 years ago, zoledronic acid was approved to prevent skeletal complications from prostate cancer. That approval was based on the results of three randomized controlled trials. This is the design of the randomized trial in prostate cancer. At the time, it was one of the largest completed randomized trials in prostate cancer with 643 patients with castration-resistant disease. They were randomly assigned to placebo plus standard care plus or versus zoledronic acid at initially in two different dose levels. The primary outcome in this study was the proportion of patients who developed skeletal-related events, a composite endpoint that included many of those common clinical complications that I described on an earlier slide. These are the results of the trial. Compared to placebo, zoledronic acid significantly reduced the risk of skeletal-related events. And as I indicated in my earlier comment, this contributed to the ultimate approval of zoledronic acid to prevent skeletal complications in men with prostate cancer. The drug is also approved in other solid tumors and in multiple myeloma. This was really, perhaps not in FDA parlance, but in common clinical uses, part of supportive care. Patients received other standard antineoplastic therapies and received this bone-targeted therapy with the goal of preventing the complications due to their bone metastases. Progress in further in, uh, preventing skeletal complications uh, with the recent approval of denosumab, also known as Exgeva. Rank ligand, receptor activator of kappa B ligand, is a critical mediator of osteoclast to differentiation and survival. And denosumab was developed and approved as the first therapeutic targeting this critical pathway in, in the osteoclast um, growth and differentiation. Uh, denosumab is a potent inhibitor of rank ligand and results in dramatic decreases in osteoclast activity. It is approved in a variety of benign conditions, including osteoporosis. It's also approved now 
to prevent skeletal complications in patients with solid tumors. The approval in prostate cancer was based on the results of this head-to-head -head trial versus uh, standard, the standard arm of zoledronic acid. This now, I think, becomes the largest treatment trial in, uh, in advanced disease. Uh, 1,870 patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer and bone metastases were assigned randomly to denosumab monthly versus zoledronic acid. And consistent with the design of the zoledronic acid trial, patients went on to receive other anti-neoplastic therapies, chemotherapy, secondary hormone therapies at the discretion of the treating physician. The primary endpoint was skeletal-related events defined in a very same manner as in the earlier studies. In this randomized global trial, denosumab proved superior to zoledronic acid with a significant reduction in skeletal-related events. Um, there was no increase in survival. Survival was not the primary endpoint for the trial, and so that's very fitting with the results of the earlier zoledronic acid versus placebo trial, where also no survival difference was observed. What I intended to do is uh, comment on the relative differences between these two, two drugs, since we now have choices between zoledronic acid and, and denosumab. Um, they have, uh, this is in the case of breast cancer and prostate cancer, denosumab is proven superior to zoledronic acid. It is not known to be effective in multiple myeloma and is not approved for that purpose. It has no renal toxicity, but does share some of the other uh, adverse effects of zoledronic acid, including risk for ONJ and hypocalcemia. So I wanted to be clear about commenting on those important issues. Prevention of bone metastases remains a critical unmet medical need. Um, many individuals in the field, including myself, perceive the castrate-resistant non-metastatic disease state as the optimal setting to prevent bone metastases. And the reason for that is it's a high-risk disease state uh, and one in which you could accomplish cl clinical trials in a reasonable time frame at patients uh, at greatest risk for developing bone metastases. Um, unfortunately, prior attempts to prevent metastases in this setting have been unsuccessful. Large randomized controlled trials of atrocentan have failed. Similarly, an earlier trial of zoledronic acid failed in this setting. In part, the failure of these earlier trials was the fact that although this is a high-risk high disease state, the event rate assumptions were off, and the observed event rate was far lower than expected. And in fact, the zoledronic acid study was aborted for that reason. Uh, we looked at the data from that aborted trial and found that men with higher PSA or more rapid PSA doubling time had higher, higher risk for adverse events, as shown in this slide. This is the data broken down in tertiles showing that patients with higher baseline PSA or more rapid rate of PSA rise had a faster time to first bone metastases in this important disease state of castration-resistant disease with, without baseline bone metastases. Uh, and we use that data to inform the design of a successor trial looking at denosumab. This is the de design of the denosumab metastasis prevention study. This is a global trial about 1,500 patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer were randomly assigned to denosumab monthly versus placebo. We selected patients at higher risk for developing bone metastases based on a PSA greater than 8 or PSA doubling time less than 10 months. Patient to uh, allow patient and physician acceptance of the randomized design for bone-targeted therapy, patients went on to receive other therapies at the discretion of the treating physician, re recognizing, of course, that there's no approved therapy at this time um, in patients without established metastatic disease. The primary endpoint for this trial is bone metastasis-free survival. The first public presentation of the data will occur later this month, but what I can say is that this is a positive trial with a significant improvement in bone metastasis-free survival and significant delay in time to first bone metastasis. Uh, radiopharmaceuticals have an established role in the symptomatic management of patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer and bone metastases. And Oliver Sarter, who will speak after me, has had a very important role in the development of some of these agents in palliation of advanced disease. Uh, and it, what I'd like to do is take a moment and comment on some emerging data about alpha rad and iridium-223, because this agent has the potential to change our perspective of the role of radiopharmaceuticals. Until to date, radiopharmaceuticals have been viewed as part of symptomatic management or palliative care. They may have greater potential to, in fact, improve 
disease control and improved survival, and that's what I'll briefly comment on. There are very important differences in the features of these agents. Strontium and samarium are beta-emitting agents, which have a low linear energy transfer in a range of several millimeters. Radium-23, by contrast, is an investigational agent, large alpha particle with a high LET and short range of penetration. Really, a lot of the excitement about this agent comes from a small randomized phase two study, 64 patients um, with castration-resistant prostate cancer and bone metastases who had received local radiation therapy for symptomatic metastases were randomized to radium-223 uh, every four weeks for four doses or matching placebo, and then followed for a variety of outcomes, including changes in biomarkers, pain, and ultimately survival as a safety signal. Here are the data um, for PSA and bone alkaline phosphatase, the latter being a marker of osteoblast activity. Uh, in this, these are the waterfall plots showing that a substantial proportion of patients following radium-223 had a decline in PSA, suggesting a, in, an anti-tumor effect, something that we would not typically expect to see in patients treated with earlier generation radiopharmaceuticals. Even greater proportion of patients had marked decline in bone alkaline phosphatase, again, a marker of osteoblast activity. So a very different change in bone, uh, bone and tumor biomarkers than would have been expected from earlier generation radiopharmaceuticals. And very provocatively in this small randomized trial, patients treated with radium-223 uh, had a longer survival. The observations of this phase two trial are now being tested in a large randomized phase three trial, about 900 patients with castration-resistant disease been being randomized to alpha radin monthly for six doses versus placebo with a primary endpoint of overall survival. And results of that mature study are expected as early as this calendar year. I'd like to conclude with brief comments on cabozantinib, formerly known as XL184. As you heard from Eleni earlier, this is a dual inhibitor of VEGF receptor in MET. Both of these um, important pathways have a role we believe in normal um, bone remodeling as well as in the pathophysiology of prostate cancer. And the observations from the clinical trials suggest that cabozantinib has an impact on each of these cellular compartments. Most of what we know about cabozantinib uh, has, in prostate cancer is derived from a large randomized discontinuation study that looked at nine different disease cohorts, including prostate cancer. And I'll just briefly comment on some of the observations from that randomized discontinuation design and ultimately the, the broader clinical development plan of this agent. Um, this is really what garnered has garnered most of the excitement about this agent. Following treatment with cabozantinib, most patients with bone metastases have dramatic improvements in their bone scans, in including some complete resolutions of disease. These are sort of representative examples of patients pre and post uh, cabozantinib with marked improvements in bone scan is shown here in as early as six weeks. Um, the results from the first 62 patients with bone metastases on the randomized discontinuation trial show that 85% of patients have some level of improvement or resolution of bone disease, an observation that just we haven't seen with any other agent in this setting. This is not merely a bone scan effect, though. There are other very supportive data indicating uh, activity. These are the effects of cabozantinib on markers of osteoblast and osteoclast activity. These are the waterfall plots. Very dramatic decreases in both alkaline phosphatase and uh, CTX. The magnitude of these changes is comparable, if not better, than you would expect to see with our best bone-targeted agents, which, again, have no impact on the underlying tumor in contrast to this agent where we're seeing these effects on bone scan. It's also clear there are effects on tumor. Um, this is best shown in this waterfall plot. These are the changes in measurable soft tissue target lesions. So this is outside of bone. And you see that most patients have a reduction in their measurable lesions. Although the resist response rate is low, less than 10%, most patients, in fact, have reduction in measurable disease consistent with that direct anti-tumor effect. As was alluded to earlier, um, PSA does not appear to be a good marker of response with this agent. Changes in PSA following cabozantinib 
um, are not well correlated with uh, stability or improvement in target immeasurable target lesions, changes in bone scans, or symptomatic improvement in bone pain. Uh, and that is similar to observations with other TKIs in, in castration-resistant disease. These very exciting res early results have led to a broader development plan. Um, and sorry if the slide doesn't project very well. The randomized discontinuation study observations, uh, for the most part, were uh, not pre-specified. And so we were expanding this study, the non-randomized extension, to pre-specify critical uh, outcomes including bone scan changes, symptomatic changes, and changes in biomarkers. The patients will be also more uniformly treatment refractory, having had to have failed at least docetaxel. Uh, and we believe the results of this rigorously conducted extension cohort will inform the design of phase three. Um, about one half of the patients in the randomized discontinuation study required dose reductions because of toxicity and that observation has led to our initiation of an investigator-sponsored trial to look at lower doses. If a drug results in improvements in bone scans in the vast majority of patients but has some toxicity, we believe there's probably a room for a better therapeutic window at lower dose. And two, phase three studies are, are now being designed to further evaluate the activity of this agent in prostate cancer. So with that, I'll conclude with the following observations. Bone metastases are a major cause of morbidity and mortality in men with prostate cancer. Zoledronic acid and denosumab decrease the risk of skeletal-related events in advanced disease and are approved for this purpose. Denosumab increases bone metastasis-free survival. An ongoing randomized controlled trial will critically evaluate the impact of alpha radon on overall survival. And early data from cabozantinib, an inhibitor of VEGF receptor and MET, has shown a novel pattern of activity in prostate cancer that will be explored in future studies. Thank you. Okay, questions? Ron. Hi, Ron DePino. Um, um, in, in the context of uh, bone disease, has it been documented that, you know, the responses to the agent, 184, is pretty impressive? and broad. Um, has it been documented that MET is in fact activated or HGF is overexpressed in a large proportion of prostate cancer bone metastases? It, it, so the question is, is, has it been demonstrated that MET is activated? Is it activated? I mean, do we know that it's a target of the tumor? Uh, I think the short answer is um, there is some information to suggest that this is an important pathway. Um, no one at the present time can tell you or anyone that we know that it is inhibition of VEGF receptor and MET that in the tumor that are responsible for this activity. Um, my best interpretation of all the data is that this, in fact, like that cartoon, that this agent has impact on the tumor compartment and bone compartment, may also have effects on the vascular compartment. It is likely that all of those activities combined are responsible for this novel profile of, of effects that we're seeing. Um, it's hard to, so in a, so in a way, the, the way I think about this, since nearly all patients have this if, uh, improvement in bone scan, I think the selection of patients for current and future trials is the patients with bone metastases, and that'll be the selection. So, this is, this is a different view on targeted therapy. This isn't, this isn't like CML in the sense that we're not going to look for patients who have the, 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 the rearrangement to, to treat with this agent. I think it's, the selection will be patients with bone metastases. And another Exalexis uh, uh, targeted therapy, 880, has a very similar uh, spectrum of activity with respect to the targets. Has that sh also shown activities in, um, in, in bone disease? So the rights to that drug are, are now with another company. They're not Exalexis. And I'm not aware of data of that agent in patients with bone metastases. There, I think there's relatively limited clinical trial data with that agent, and I'm not aware of data about it in, in, uh, in patients with bone metastases in general or prostate cancer specifically. Matt, isn't it true, though, that there have been other MET inhibitors tried in prostate cancer which have not shown uh, noticeable benefit. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that we know that. There aren't too many pure MET inhib inhibitors. There are, there are a number of agents that have been tried, um, and I would, I would take that in a way as 
evidence that inhibition of MET alone is probably ineffective. I have no reason to believe that selective inhibition of MET would share this activity. We can be sure, I think, fair to say, that selective inhibition of some of the other pathways, including VEGF receptor, are not sufficient to confer this kind of activity. The closest small molecule TKI by profile of uh, inhibition, actually, Mike, if you could go to the next slide. So here's what we know about, other T, uh, about TKIs in, in castration-resistant prostate cancer. So we have some data from phase two from serafinib, sunitinib, also now phase three. And this is just my summary of the, what are reported to be the molecular targets. And you see that the, the main difference here is that you do inhibit MET. Uh, sunitinib is pretty close otherwise. Um, we studied this uh, sunitinib in, in a phase two trial in prostate cancer, saw a few bone scan improvements, very weak effects on bone, so quite a different profile of activity. Uh, and, as you, and as you know, the, a phase three trial uh, of sunitinib failed, but I would submit the clinical data is dramatically different. The presumed target, the di distinction appears to be primarily MET. Um, we don't have detailed data about MET inhibition alone, uh, and I don't think it would confer this type of activity. Okay, we have time for one more question in the back. Victor Moyo, uh, has anyone ever tried to uh, correlate the uh, responses you see with that XL compound to other surrogates of long-term uh, long outcomes, such as circulating tumor cells? So it's a great question. Given that PSA does not appear to be helpful uh, or correlate with other indications of activity, we and others are very interested in looking at that very question. And in part of the non-randomized non extension study, we'll systematically collect CTC information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt.